on hair black or white. I'm assistant to the Bishop for Administration, who keeps us all on task. Ms. Robin McCants, who is the assistant to the Bishop for Urban Ministry and Advocacy. Pastor Sean Eubank, who is our Director of Evangelical Mission. And Bishop Donald Chris, who is the bishop. <laughs> he is currently in Washington, D.C., visiting his son, Perry, uh, who is an aide at the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol. So there's a picture floating around of Bishop Chris sitting in the chair of the chairperson of the Ways and Means Committee in that chamber. So I think he feel, felt pretty proud of himself yesterday when he was uh, touring the Capitol with his son. He wants you to know that you continue to be in his prayers, especially as you begin this new season of ministry with Pastor Siki as your um, soul and senior pastor. I think over the last year, Pastor Siki has probably said this. When I was in the Holy Land. <laughs> yeah, I figured. Yeah, he said that a few times. I'm going to say it too, because I was in the Holy Land with Pastor Siki last year in January. There were 20 of us from the Southeast Michigan Synod on a tour um, with an organization called Good Shepherd Travel. They are Palestinian Christians who, um, who take people on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So it was the first time I went, the first and only time so far that I have been there. And I had heard from everyone that once you go, you will um, never see scripture in the same way again. And I thought, sure, that's everybody else. <laughs> that might not be me. I, I, I didn't go with a closed mind, but I didn't really expect to be changed in the ways that I was changed. But once, once you go and stand in the places where you know Jesus stood, uh, and once you um, put your feet in the Sea of Galilee or touch the water of the River Jordan or um, float in the Dead Sea, things change. You start to, to see in your head exactly what the words are on the paper. It was an extraordinary trip. It was smashed into five days in the country, um, and we saw so much that I'm still trying to process all of it. Now, I heard from the first service people that Pastor Scott didn't tell you this part. For some of us, um, our, our trip culminated in a place you might not expect. Uh, we ended our trip on our last day in Jerusalem in a tattoo parlor. <laughs> I don't, I'm not kidding. We really did. So in the old city of Jerusalem, there's a place called Razuk Tattoos. The Razuk family has been um, tattooing Christians for 700 years. Get your head around that. 700 years. That was the 14th century, the 1300s. In, um, in Egypt to start, they're Coptic or Egyptian Christians. In the 1300s, in the 14th century, the Muslim faith had taken over in Egypt, right? And it wasn't safe to be a Christian. So the Razuk family began by tattooing small crosses on the inside of the wrists of Christians so that they could enter churches safely. 200 years later, or that's still just the 1500s, the 16th century, the Razuk family moves to the old city of Jerusalem. Now the Crusades are over, but people um, throughout Europe and Asia and in and, and the, the known world at the time are making pilgrimage to, to, um, to Jerusalem still. So they began tattooing uh, Christian pilgrims. Uh, Wasim Razuk uh, is the 27th gener generation of his family to be a tattoo artist in the old city of Jerusalem. So um, as I left for the trip, I knew I was going to get a tattoo because all of the cool kid pastors, uh, which I am not one of, um, <laughs> but all of the younger ones had gotten tattoos when they were in the Holy Land, so I, I was going to do the same thing. And my intention was to get a small Jerusalem cross, which is a symbol of a pilgrimage. Usually folks do that and then have the date written um, under it to mark the year that they've been on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So I was, um, I was a little late. I, I wanted to be near the end. I was gathering my courage for the tattoo, but I was looking through books of examples, and the way that the Razuk family does this is they have um, wooden stamps, some of which are three, four hundred years old, that they take purple ink and they stamp on your, wherever it is, for me it's on my wrist, um, and then they tattoo over that ink. It makes it a, a quick process. So I was looking at pictures of the stamps, and then I saw this one. It was a dove, oh, the Holy Spirit, a dove, and it said, um, beloved on the top, and then it said son below, S-O-N. 
well, I'm not a son, but that word beloved had become um, my touchstone, the word that I had been hanging on to for the last four years before that. In 2016, I was granted a sabbatical by St. John in Farmington, where my husband, Bill, and I were serving. And my sabbatical um, was about Sabbath keeping, what it looks to step, what it looks like to step away and out of time. And so during that sabbatical, I hired a sabbatical coach, a man um, named Wayne Muller, who is a United Church of Christ pastor. He literally wrote the book on Sabbath. His big best-selling book is called Sabbath. <laughs> So I hired him to, to direct me as a spiritual director through my, um, through my sabbatical process. And I went to Santa Fe, New Mexico to spend a week with him. And he handed me a book. He said, I don't want you to do anything this week, but I want you to read this book. And the book was called Life of the Beloved. It's written by Father Henry Nowen. Now, some of you might recognize his name. Henry Nowen was a Roman Catholic priest. He died in the mid-90s. He was a prolific writer. He wrote small and simple books that help people understand the basics of Christian faith. So he had written this book called Life of the Beloved, and as I read that book, something switched in my brain. And I finally started to understand that the thing is that I'm God's beloved too, that I was claimed in baptism and called beloved. Now you would think that was a big old duh moment, right? I had been ordained for 17 years at that point. I'd been speaking, preaching, living that message for other people for all of that time. But here's the thing. I was so wrapped up in trying to be good, in trying to do good things, to be in control of my life, to be the best wife and mother and pastor that I could be, that I often ended up feeling inadequate and unworthy and just sheer exhausted. I spent more time listening to the world that was telling me that if I just did more, if I produced more, if I worked harder, then I would be good enough. Then God would love me. Now you know that's the opposite of our Lutheran theology, right? That we don't do anything to earn God's love, that it's a free gift of, of God's grace. <laughs> but I still got hooked into that, that piece of the world that told me I just had to work harder. So, I get this book in my hand, and I get about five or ten pages in, and I read this passage, and this is what really changed the game for me. Henry Nowen writes this. Uh, before I tell you that, the book was written to um, an agnostic Jewish reporter, newspaper reporter, who had become a friend of Henry Nowen's, and Henry wanted him to understand what it was about Jesus and God that was so important, and why he should consider believing in God. So he writes this. We are the beloved. We are intimately loved long before our parents, teachers, spouses, children, and friends loved or wounded us. That's the truth of our lives. That's the truth I want you to claim for yourself. That's the truth spoken by the voice that says, you are my beloved. You are my beloved with whom I am well pleased. That's what Jesus heard, right, when he came up out of the waters of his own baptism in the River Jordan. The dove comes and speaks those words, God's voice, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. We were in the Holy Land the week of the baptism of our Lord. We got to stand at the River Jordan and mark crosses on each other's foreheads to remind us of our belovedness. So my tattoo, which you can see after worship if you'd like, is a reminder of that, that that word beloved that captured me and has held me since then is now literally on my body. You can also talk to me after worship about a trip to the Holy Land if you're interested in that. That's my one plug, but I have a list, and if you'd like to come with me next January, I'm going again to embrace that, um, that experience. So Jesus, he's at the River Jordan, he comes up, he hears this, you are my beloved son, with you, my, uh, with you I am well pleased. That's the beginning of his public ministry. That's where he really gets started. So he's driven, you're going to hear this story in two or three weeks at the beginning of Lent, he's driven out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Forty days and forty nights in that desolate, sandy, hot, waterless place, the desert of Israel. 
He holds on to that belovedness. He's able to fight the devil and then leave there and head back to Galilee, back near the Sea of, um, to the, back near the sea of Galilee where he starts his ministry. He starts to pick people to follow him. He starts to teach and heal and preach. And that's where we find him right now in our gospel reading. He's on what's called the Mount of Beatitudes. There's a church there because there's a church every single place where um, Jesus was. It's a beautiful church, and it's uh, surrounded by gardens where you can walk and see all of the Beatitudes on, written out in many different languages. Um, Jesus is on that mount because that's a good place for him to be so people can see him and hear him. And he's teaching important things. And we have a series of these readings. This is, the, I think, the third and last of the readings for now from the Sermon on the Mount. Two weeks ago, when we heard the Beatitudes, we might have been tempted to hear those as condemnation, as something we're not doing enough of. You might be tempted, especially if you're like me and you're trying to be enough and do enough and, and follow faithfully enough. So Jesus says, blessed are the meek, right? Or blessed are the poor in spirit. We might hear that as blessed are the meek if you do X, Y, and Z, or blessed are the persecuted for uh, if you follow this and do that and, and have people yelling and screaming at you, <laughs> right? I don't think that's what the Sermon on the Mount really is, though. I think that the Beatitudes in particular that start the Sermon on the Mount are um, Jesus already naming us blessed, reminding the people that are listening to him that they are beloved of God. They're already blessed. It changes the way you understand yourself and understand the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. There was a study done um, 25, 30 years ago about children. So if a child is um, criticized once, it takes 10 times of praise of praising them for their self-esteem to raise back to the same level as that criticism. For adults, maybe it's not ten times, maybe it's three times or four or five times we need to hear something good after we've been criticized. You know how that is, it gets in your head and you start to believe it. So for children, if they're called lazy or, um, or, or stupid, hopefully no one uses that word anymore, but it, if they hear those things about themselves, they might start becoming that. If we hear those things about ourselves, we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we don't do enough, we're not meek enough, we're, not, uh, we're too rich, we're, uh, we're not persecuted enough because we don't do enough for Jesus, we might start to believe that about ourselves. But if we hear Jesus saying, you're blessed, you're already blessed, you're blessed when you're meek, you're blessed when you're poor, and 